Um, I'm Katie, co-founder CEO at Inscribe, which is a virtual community platform. So we're gonna be looking at some great examples of how Inscribe is used. And then toward the end of the conversation today, we'll actually jump into the product and kind of look around at some of the features that help drive the outcomes that we're gonna discuss. I am joined today by Danielle Bonner, who runs all of our sales and marketing for the organization. She um, operates for the organization. Um, she is also gonna help us stay on track. So as we're talking, if you have questions, comments, any kind of feedback, please put it in the chat. Danielle will keep an eye on that and make sure that we are answering any questions that come up along the way. One note on the chat is when you open it, it's probably gonna to default to posting just to host and moderators. So I encourage you to change that to everybody so all the participants can see the great comments that you're adding. Um, and of course, we'll incorporate those. Um, and then also joined today by Aaron Knox, who's our Chief Revenue Officer. Aaron also helps us think through some of the great um, opportunities in the market. You'll probably be hearing from him as a follow-up. Uh, we are recording this session today, so we'll send that out in an email afterward. And that email will probably come from Aaron, so great for you to be able to put a face to that name. Um, and they'll also join in and provide commentary as we go. Uh, did I miss any housekeeping? I don't think so. So I'm a little bit under the weather. It's a little bit foggy up there. But did you mention that today's session is going to be recorded? I did say that. Yes, recorded. Perfect. We'll come out afterward. Awesome. Thank um, you. Okay. The only other thing housekeeping wise, uh, if you can introduce yourself via the chat, that would be uh, that would be great. Joe. Uh, uh, has already. So thank you for that. But it's always great to know who you are, uh, the your role at the institution and the uh, the school that you come from. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yes. And if there's anything in particular that brought you here today, please let us know. Uh, we want to make sure that we address any specific questions or challenges that you might be facing in your work. Um, so just a quick introduction to Inscribe. I mentioned we're a virtual community platform. Platform is designed specifically to support non-traditional students. So my background, I've been working in higher education technology for really my whole career. And during that time, um, primarily focused on creating technology to support digital learning um, and learning at scale. And one of the things that was very clear to me during that process is that non-traditional students and students who are learning online um, while technology has done a lot to really democratize access to degrees and education, which is fantastic, not as much energy and not as much thought was um, went into how we can actually leverage technology to create a fully formed education experience for these students. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I think everybody on this webinar today knows that academics, learning, the work that's done in or around the classroom is obviously a core element of what that experience looks like for anybody in post-secondary. But for most students, and for a lot of us, I think here today, that ex classroom experience is paired with a human experience, all the things that happen outside the classroom, the people that you meet, the relationships that you build, the network that you're generating, um, and the importance of those relationships in helping build confidence in learners, helping them succeed while they're in their degree program, and then the outside benefits that those relationships have for individuals once they've graduated. So Inscribe was designed as a platform to really recreate all of those out of classroom connections, conversations, and support opportunities that traditional students just get naturally by being on campus. We always talk about Inscribe as human first technology enabled. So Absolutely, tech can do a lot to help us scale and improve reach and improve access. But at the end of the day, it's the human beings and the relationships and conversations that they are actually having together, which power the energy behind these networks and these support systems. So we're not a chat bot. Our intention is never to replace these interactions fully um, with just a computer generated conversation. And when we look at some of the outcomes that we're seeing, I think it'll help reinforce why that human to human touch is so critical. Um, I'm gonna skip, I, I feel like I touched on this already in terms of the why are we here, but in this age of you know, generative AI and the increases of um, all the different ways that tech can be used to replace human interaction, I really just wanna re-emphasize why in certain circumstances that could be valuable, but that we need to be careful that we don't rely on that as our sole source 
of um, interaction for these learners. And in particular, some of these very vulnerable learners who maybe are first generation, you know, coming from underserved communities, making sure that that human connection remains a core element of their experience. Um, don't need to probably tell everyone on this call, but part of the urgency, I think, of the work that we're doing is that so many of our students today really don't fit into that traditional mold. They've got a million things going on, <clears throat> excuse me, very, very busy, um, lucky to be on campus at all. And if they are, they're potentially commuting, but many, many of them are choosing to take their entire degree online. And that can end up being a very isolating experience. And we hear from students that many of them have very little interaction with peers outside of what is prescribed to them in the classroom. Many of them feel like they've taken a big risk going back to school or to continue their post-secondary degree, and they're not really confident that they have the skill set to do it. So this concept of imposter syndrome starts to settle in. Um, they feel that maybe they're the only one that doesn't really get it or is struggling. And those thoughts, those um, thoughts that can cause a lack of confidence and a lack of uh, focus when you're isolated and you're really working and learning alone and you don't have exposure to other people, that can really fester. So these mental health challenges that some students go through can ultimately be a big driver for why these non many of our non-traditional students find it difficult to persist through their learning. And I don't know if some of you have experienced that with your online populations. A lot of schools that we work with that'll have both an on-ground and an online component, um, they see much lower retention and persistent rates among their fully online students. And isolation, access to information, um, sense of belonging can be a big driver for that. Uh, belonging is a big part of the work that we do. I know it's a lot of what's being talked about, especially post-COVID, really recognizing the importance of sense of belonging for our learners. And it really touches on all aspects of the student journey. So finding your footing, really believing that you can succeed, having the ability to persist when times get tough because you have a network of people that you can reach out to and you trust. And then there's a lot of studies that actually show that if you can establish strong sense of belonging for learners, while they're with you, it will in fact have ongoing benefits for them once they land in the workplace. So up to 10 years of continued higher performance and higher success rates because they gained that confidence and that sense that they um, had a group of people that they could really rely on when they were with you as part of the institution. The sort of other side of that coin that we talk about is this concept of social capital. So while belonging is very much an innate thing that helps people feel comfortable and confident, social capital is almost the outward projection of that, that describes the network that people have built that they can rely on and go to when they need additional help and support, not just um, when they're getting their degree, but obviously when they're starting to think about a transition to a career or elevating their careers. So, a huge part of the value of a degree is not just the knowledge that I've gained, but the people that I've met that I can then capitalize on later after I've left my, um, moved on and become an alumni. So we don't want our non-traditional and our online students to miss out on that core element. What can we do while they're with us to help them identify people and build those relationships so that they can also gain this benefit for the long term? So this is all about what we do. So our communities are designed really around four core elements. Number one, improving persistence rates and out positive outcomes for learners. So we'll see some great examples of that. But at the end of the day, if we're not helping more students succeed through their program, we're not helping you achieve your goals. The second piece of that that is sort of foundational are things like belonging. Um, which we have a great research study foundation for. We'll talk a little bit about some of the work we did with Rio Salado, but how are we actually improving a student's sense of peer connection and belonging at the institution? How are we helping them build social capital and a network that they can take with them? And then fourth, we're gonna achieve all these amazing things for your learners. We need to be able to do it in a way that is efficient and cost-effective for you. So scalability is the fourth component that is critical to these communities we are able to improve all of these outcomes while at the same time saving your staff um, and the folks at your institution 
hours in their week that they can then spend on higher order activities. And so we'll take a look at how that works. Danielle, anything you want me to touch on before I jump in? We don't have any questions in the chat. I will just echo what uh, Aaron dropped into the chat there. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along and we will interrupt and uh, interrupt Katie and make sure they get answered. I do see that there is a hand raised. It says one, maybe that's a default Zoom thing. Oh, is there? In the participants screen. Yeah, so I would just encourage that person to drop their, their question in the chat. Sometimes it just gets accidentally clicked. Oh gotcha. yeah, Josh. Yeah, I don't think we can elevate you to the to the speaking role with the setup that we have, but please put your question in the chat. We'd love to answer it, um, unless it was just a mistake. So, what is the peer community? Uh, technologically, I think we can all picture it, and we will take a look at it. It's a, a virtual space where people can come together to have conversations. It's about sharing ideas and advice um, and content and knowledge. But it's also, if we think about the particular value proposition for this population, because of its digital virtual nature, it is extremely flexible. So it's available anytime, Sunday night at 1 a.m., Monday morning at 4 a.m., Wednesday afternoon, whenever these students need or feel the need to connect or reach out, the, space, the digital space is always there for them. And it's accessible from wherever they are. So we'll look at how the integration works, but think about it as, you know, regardless of whether I'm at work or I'm at home, I can always access this space and know that it's there and available. So, and the reliability. It's also a safe place. Part of this is how we support you in launching the community and the narrative that you put out around the space, but it essentially creates a safe space for learners to really start to talk about things that they're excited about, worried about, confused about, students that would never raise their hand, um, you know, in a classroom setting or even in like a you know synchronous zoom setting when you give them access to a an asynchronous digital space where they can kind of take the time to think about how to craft their questions and their comments when they start to see other people asking things that are very similar to what they were thinking and feeling you welcome in a broad set of voices to start to have conversations that otherwise are very often excluded so this safe space where you're going to really amplify participation and then the last piece is, it is a living knowledge repository. So all the content that is generated in your community is added to the centralized database and then becomes accessible to all the other participants in that space. So no longer is it just the one inquisitive student who is reaching out and asking questions and getting all of the answers. Now, all the information that that really inquisitive student is generating becomes instantly available to everybody. So you're opening up and democratizing access to knowledge in a way that is super efficient, meaning that you are only answering a question once instead of a hundred times. And that content is reusable over essentially the lifespan of the community, which might be many years if you continue to, if you sort of grow and persist the community over time. There is a question in the chat. Yeah. In what ways do digital communities improve the sense of belonging compared to traditional online forums or discussion forums? Um, I actually haven't seen any studies around, specifically around growth of belonging using discussion boards. I imagine they exist, but I will say, um, sense of belonging is going to be driven by levels of participation, engagement um, and authenticity. And what we have heard from institutions who are trying to leverage like the LMS discussion board to accomplish this goal is that number one, the level of participation that they often see in those spaces is quite low. It's kind of awkward to get to, I think students view it very much as like a component of their academics. And so it doesn't feel like a place that I want to go and share more social conversation. Um, and they can be a little bit difficult to navigate. You know, they're not really designed to be searchable or scalable or, you know, engaging in that way. So when you lower the level of engagement and participation, you're necessarily going to lower the opportunity for peer connection and belonging. The other piece is because I think it feels a little bit more structured the types of engagements that our customers were seeing when they were trying to use those 
spaces felt less authentic. Um, and what I mean by that is very sort of surface level. Maybe you'd get some questions in there. Um, maybe somebody would express, you know, something that had happened that day, but they weren't really getting like the deep emotional conversation out of the learners that they were looking for, which is what they got when they switched to a platform like Inscribe. So part of it, I think, is access. Part of it is just the design of the space and the preconceived notion of what's going on in there. Awesome. So Catherine, Catherine, if you have any other, sorry, if you have any other questions, follow up questions, please let us know. Yeah. Happy to provide, happy to go deeper on that for sure. Um, oh my goodness. Am I, oh, all right. So I'm going to go over a few examples with you before we jump into the product. One of the really neat things I think about the four examples that we're going to go through here, in some ways, they're very similar. These are peer communities that were established to bring many, many learners together. We'd call them co-curricular. So they weren't designed around a particular program or a particular college. Um, so there's a great diversity of learners in these spaces. And um, most of the institutions that we were working with were really focused on things like persistence and belonging. What's neat about, what's different about the, th the four examples we're gonna look at is the type of institution. So really getting a perspective that no matter how big or small you are, no matter the, mo the modality or the design of your degree programs, every type of institution and student can really benefit from a space like this. So starting off with the University of Maryland Global Campus, I'm sure many of you are familiar, very, very large, you know, primarily online institution. They serve a big military population, so they have students all over the world. Um, really difficult to ever get anybody together synchronously and can be really difficult to kind of build community when you have such a diversity of location and type of learner and age of learner. So what they did is they picked up, they adopted Inscribe and integrated it into their PACE course, which is, I actually can't remember what it stands for. It's essentially the introductory course where students come in and learn how to learn online. Um, and really it's their welcome into the university. During the pilot that we did, which was about six months, they had over 8,000 students come through this course and um, they accessed it through the course in the LMS. And it was really a space for them to just talk about what they were learning, share ideas, come together. And they saw enormous benefits. So you can see here, um, oops, significantly higher completion rates for the students who were accessing the Inscribe platform. So what they did is actually an A-B test. So half the PACE courses had access to Inscribe and half the courses did not. And for those students that were in the inscribe based courses, an almost 25% improvement in the number of students that completed and then persisted on to start their degree. So really outsized um, impact for what is essentially a fairly small implementation. Uh, another great example is University of North Texas. So they also built a virtual community for their online students. Their um, target was a little bit broader. So it was um, not, it was, um, portal integrated versus direct versus course based. This was, you know, anybody who logged into the LMS could access the community. They had their advisors in there and it was a great way for their advisors to also push out information um, to students about activities that were coming up, events that were going to be hosted. And in their case, uh, in just one semester, over many thousands of students, a 13% increase in the student persistence rate. So students finishing their fall term and then deciding to come back and sign up for spring term, a 13% jump year over year. And I think we have case studies for all of these that Danielle is going to post um, for yeah, you all. It will be in the chat shortly. So shifting away from persistence, although of course these things are tightly connected, um, Rio Salado. So now we've gone from a giant, like a really, really big online school to a large traditional, more traditional school with online students. And now Rio Salado, which is a community college in Arizona. They have, um, I believe something like 16,000 students that come through their college every year. Most of them are learning online. They started as an online institution. So they still have predominantly online learners. And we're really struggling with helping those students feel a connection to the, to the college and like many of their counterparts, making sure that they were completing their two-year degree and helping support them in potentially in a transition to four-year. They launched their Rio Connect community. 
And we did a really interesting study with them that was supported by a group called College Innovation Network. So they helped design the study and implement it. And it ran over the, essentially the first six weeks of the term and the first six weeks of the implementation of Inscribe. So we measured, we um, surveyed students at the beginning of the term and then again, six weeks in. And what we found was the students who participated in Inscribe reported significantly higher levels of belonging and peer connection than those who did not. And what was even more exciting was for the students at the beginning of the term who hadn't participated, um, they initially reported quite low measures of belonging. But after participating over the six weeks, their levels of belonging had increased to meet those of the students who had participated the full time. So we could actually see the impact of the community on that individual student or that set of students um, reported sense of belonging and connection. So really wonderful. And this, by the way, is a study that we can replicate. So we have a design for it. If this is something you're interested in thinking about at your institution, but maybe don't have the surveys or the design set up, we can bring all of that to the table and help you put that together. I think that's such an important point, Katie, because belonging is really hard to track, right? How do we measure belonging? And so mm -hmm. having that, that template for um, partners, I think is huge. It's important. Yes. Um, and I, yeah, I totally agree. I think that that's one of the things that has prevented people from studying it for a long time mm -hmm. is just not really knowing where to start or how to think about it or how to measure it. And so having that as a starting place can be really helpful. Um, and then the last example I'm gonna give here is Fort Hayes State University. So now a slightly smaller traditional four-year university. Um, they also have about equal numbers of in-person students and online learners but they really wanted to create a space that would bring all their students together. So they launched their Tiger to Tiger community, um, also co-curricular and available to all learners, whether you were in person, online, regardless of your program of study, graduate, undergraduate. And they did something really unique, which was um, brought their students in to both help design it and to help run and manage it they really wanted to take a very hands-off approach. So staff and faculty were not uh, prevented from going into the community, but it was really the students who were given the reins to, to run the space, design it how they wanted it to be and help encourage each other. And it took off like a rocket. And this is one of our favorite posts that came in here. Um, somebody had jumped in and said, oh, I don't, you know, maybe I'm too old. I don't know that I can do this. It's really hard. And, you know, within, well, and it, and it, Andrew Feldstein, who's our primary, um, who really led this initiative for Fort Hayes State, he, he likes to tell this story because when he saw that post come in, it was the first time he felt like he might need to violate his own tenant about, I'm going to stay hands off. I'm just going to let the students run it. Cause he saw this post come in and he was like, oh no, if somebody doesn't jump in and say something, this student was willing to be vulnerable and say this. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, maybe I need to jump in and, and say something, but he waited. And he said, after about 10 minutes, he went back and looked and there were hundreds of views of the post and, you know, 10 or 15 people had already responded with support, supportive comments. Don't worry, we're in this together. I was feeling the same way, you know, so just by taking that pause and, and like letting the students do their thing, the community really stepped up to, to be the thing that he had wanted it to be, where students are really helping each other. And you can imagine if you're an adult learner coming back, maybe you have some of that imposter syndrome, you're feeling pretty nervous. It's one thing for an advisor or a coach to say to you, like, don't worry, you can do it. We have lots of students like you on campus. It's a totally different game if another student who is living that same experience as you jumps in and provides that support and that answer. You know, it, it just kind of cuts to the core for you, I think, in a very, very different way. And Andrew will always say, if it's if just one student saw this conversation and that's what helped keep them going and help them persist, then like the work here was well worth it. Now, our studies with them have shown that many more students um, are, are receiving that positive benefit, but you can see like how personal the stories are that happen in here and how valuable they are. Um, any questions, Danielle? What am I doing on time? 
You're doing great on time. So it, we have about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, um, probably a little bit longer, but I think that you might want to wrap up a little bit early and let people move on and transition to their next meeting. However, I don't have any questions in the chat at this point. I will encourage people to drop them in there and we will again, answer them as we go along. Awesome. Thank you. So when I do the demo, I'm really just going to demo inscribe straight up. Um, but I, I do want to mention that the platform is designed for integration. So one of the things that I think is very unique about our organization is that we don't just bring the technology and the product to the table. We actually also bring a lot of expertise around how to build a community, how to launch a community, what a healthy community looks like, all the best practices that you need to really make this successful. I, I'm sure there are some folks on the webinar today who have tried this with other platforms or other technologies. And I'm guessing for some of you, the students just didn't show up, you know, or maybe it was really active for a week and then it just died down. We And we do run into people all the time that will say, how do I know it's going to be different in this case? And the reality is the platform is just one piece of the puzzle. You really do need to pair it with the knowledge, the expertise, and the best practices for community management and growth that not every organization really has. And so if you work with Inscribe, what we do is we partner you with a client success team member. That person essentially becomes part of your team. Um, and it's their job to really guide you through the launch process, meet with you on a regular basis throughout your duration of your partnership with us, make sure that the community is achieving the goals it's meant to achieve. And if not, what adjustments do we want to make to get you to where you, where you need to be? Um, that is not to say that, you know, Inscribe is not the only community platform out there and you can achieve great success with other community models. I would just encourage you, if you are gonna go down this path, make sure you have both of those elements available with whoever you're working with. You know, really push them to know that you're gonna get that expertise and that support alongside of the great technology that they bring to the table. So why I bring that up? Because one of the key elements of making a community thrive is access. So you really have to have the community woven into the workflows that your students are already going through. So you want it to be deeply integrated. In this case, um, you know, an example would be, in, can it be integrated into your LMS? Can it be integrated into your portal, your websites, your mobile app? Like where are the places your students are already going that it makes sense to create access points there? So we integrate to all of those things, all the major LMS platforms, many of the portal platforms, um, we also have a mobile app, so most of the time your students will probably access the community on the web going through these integrations, but we, they can also download a native app, have it on their phone, and just keep their community in their back pocket. It's a great way to keep notified of what's happening in there, um, and you know, for, for students on the go, that can often be table stakes to make sure that they continue to have access and it's front and center when they need it. So again, I just bring that up because I'm not going to necessarily demo the integration today, but just keep in mind that that's a core element of what you'll want um, from your product. So let's take a look. All right. Okay. So um, we are just to orient us. We are in the Inscribe platform, in the Inscribe institution, and in a community called Students Connect. Communities can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. So we have communities that are built and designed around the admissions process, welcoming in new students. We have communities that are built and designed around academics and learning. So maybe you have a math community or a writing community. Um, but the examples that we talked about earlier and when we're thinking about trying to recreate more a more collaborative environment for online learners, this type of peer community, co-curricular peer community, is really the best starting point. Uh, it's easy to implement because you welcome in, you know, um, ideally you just welcome in all of your students to this shared space. You can deploy it for a smaller number of learners if you want, but it is kind of a more the merrier scenario. So the more you can welcome in, the faster it'll grow. Integrated into the portal, the LMS, the website, um, and then you're off and running. Now, just to orient you in here, the communities themselves are primarily organized by topic area. Um, and this 
again, is something that we'll essentially bring, we can bring a template to you to say, you know, these are the topics that we have seen work really well in this scenario, but they're all customizable. So you can reflect the language that your students are going to be used to um, in their work with you. The communities can also have channels. So depending on how big your student population is, if you have a lot, a lot of students, it can be nice to create some subgroups in the community to reflect particular areas of interest or backgrounds that students might have. If you have a smaller student population, this usually is not necessary to create smaller corridors, or you can grow into it over time. So maybe you start with everybody in one big space together, and then as you see like where popular conversations are taking place or students reaching out asking for maybe a subspace, then you can add those along the way. The community itself is designed to be very dynamic. So you'll evolve your community over time as you learn more about what your students are interested in and asking about. Um, questions, Danielle? No questions at this time. It sounds like maybe we were having some trouble with the links in the chat. So if anybody has any trouble with the links, please let me know and I'm happy to email them to you as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, so, when students come to your community, they're probably coming for one of two reasons. They're just curious and they wanna browse around or meet other people, in which case the topics are really critical. It just helps organize the content. It makes it really easy for students to know where to go, um, to sort of see what other people have been posting and browse around, or they might come in because they have a specific question. And this is where that scalability piece comes in. If a conversation is already taking place on a particular topic, or if you have answered a question for somebody, there is no reason that we should restart that conversation or have to answer that question again. So one thing a student could do is simply search. So if I'm looking for a study group, oops, not a study group. Um, I can start, uh, I can type into the search what I'm looking for, and it will search across all of the content of the community to deliver me back to anywhere that might help me. Um, but we know that students don't always leverage those tools when they're made available to them. So what we did is we actually incorporated search into the question asking process. So if a student starts to post a new conversation, um, what happened is that this um, pop up down here is Rosie. She's the technology assistant that lives in our communities. And she realized that this student is starting a conversation about something that probably has already been answered or people are already talking about. And so in, subtly, Rosie is going to redirect that learner to one of these spaces where probably they can already engage or get what they need without having to post anything and wait for another reply. So that's a really helpful tool in terms of that scalability aspect, but also for the learner, you know, like if you post something, you have to wait a little while for somebody to jump in. If that question's already been answered or that information's already out there, let's get them connected to that solution as quickly as possible. While we're in here, um, this is the conversation starting um, experience. So a student could come in, initiate a new conversation, give it a title, add some content. You can see that you can put lots of cool widgets in there, make it really personal, dynamic. Um, but really what I want to point out here is that this is an area where we have reinforced that idea of giving students agency over how they show up in these spaces. I mentioned earlier that a virtual space is much more likely to welcome a broader set of voices than if you rely on synchronous interaction or students raising their hand in front of a big group of people. The, uh, the way that we also reinforce that, um, one of the ways that we reinforce that is here. So when a student goes to participate in a community, they can post just publicly so everyone can see them and their post, but they can also choose to post anonymously or they can choose to post privately. So it just goes to the moderators. Essentially, if you're a little bit nervous, if you're not quite sure that you found your footing in here, you haven't quite built that trust with the space yet, these are great tools to allow those people to come in and participate freely while they're you know, building their sense of confidence that this is a place that they can really be active and learning. So this is a really important element if you're building community for your learners that they have some flexibility here. Um, when the post gets made, one of the other really cool features is all the members of your community will get a notification. And that notification says um, who posted, what the content of the post was, and gives them the opportunity to click right back through that notification to engage, participate, 
um, respond to the post. You know, students are not going to be clicking into the community every five minutes to see what's going on. So it's really beholden that your community space is reaching out to the participants to say, here's all the exciting things that are happening and drawing them back in through that mechanism. Those notifications go out through email or through the mobile app and are very customizable. So students can decide, what do I want to hear about? What do I want to get a summary about maybe at the end of the day? And what am I not interested in getting notified about? So it's very individualized, make sure that they're not feeling overwhelmed by the amount of content coming out of the space. Kitty, there is a chat or a question in the chat, excuse me, um, in regards to maybe bad behavior. So the person mentioned, I think that we've all experienced students who are not satisfied and find these types of platforms as a place to vent or possibly uh, discourage others. How do you, we manage this when trying to allow students to form communities without supervision? Yeah, great question. Um, and certainly a question that we get all the time when we're talking to folks. The real answer to that question is that it's very, very rare that a student uses their inscribed community for that type of communication. We don't totally know why, but I think because it's integrated into sort of formal systems of the university, it's not a separate, you know, Facebook space or Discord or Reddit where a lot of these unmanaged communities take place. Because it's managed, because um, you can post anonymously, but the moderators can still see who it is. So there really isn't like full anonymity in the platform. Students do bring them their best selves to the space. And I know it's hard to convince people of that sometimes, um, but I'm happy to connect you with, if anyone's really curious, I'm happy to connect you with some of our partners who have experienced that um, and they can share their, um, that that is actually how they have seen the platforms working. Now, with that said, uh, we don't wanna leave the platforms totally you know, we want to make sure that we're being judicious and, and um, supportive in making sure that the communities stay healthy. So we have a couple of tools built into the platform to support that as well. Um, and that's really the other thing that Rosie does. Oh, what am I trying to get to here? We go. Uh, so when people are, when posts are made in the community, there's two things that Rosie's doing. One is a basic keyword match. So we have a long list of keywords. You can customize that list. If one of those ever appears in the post, Rosie will flag it and escalate it to you. So that would be like bad words or sometimes people will put things in there like drop out or, um, you know, FAFSA if it's around, you know, things that they think might be urgent. But then the more interesting thing Rosie will do is run all the conversations through a sentiment API. So measuring the emotion of the post. And if that emotion starts to skew negative, like heavily negative, angry, frustrated, Rosie will proactively flag that and escalate it to you. So the student doesn't see this flag, but you get an immediate notification that, hey, there's a post in the community that you might wanna go take a look at. Now it doesn't prevent students from posting, um, but what it does do is say to you, there's a high priority conversation jump in and then you can do one of a few things. You might look at it and be like, you know what, that's totally fine. No action needed. I'm just going to clear the notification. You might say, okay, this really isn't appropriate for the community and I'm going to delete it or I'm going to move it into this private status so the rest of the community doesn't see it. But what happens most of the time is it's sort of somewhere in between there, right? It's the student who's expressing a real need for support um, a real reason for frustration. And now you know who that student is and what they're struggling with, and it's an opportunity for outreach. So coaches and advisors will use it as a way to identify at-risk learners, people that just need a quick phone call or email. Um, and it can be very productive in that sense of like really getting to know what's going on with your learners that you might not other that they may not otherwise ever reach out or tell you. That was a fairly long answer to a short question. And the response is, wow, that's awesome. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I like that topic. I do tend to get into it, but yes. Um, but really students just bring their best, their best selves to these spaces. It is so heartwarming to see the conversations that take place in here and how powerful that peer voice can be 
in helping one another. Um, anything else right now, Danielle? Not at the moment. Let's keep charging forward. Okay, so conversations, very dynamic, student-driven, lots of cool things you can do in here. Two other areas that I'll just point out briefly um, are the resources area. Resources are a more curated set of assets. Really, it's just posted by you, by the moderation team. Um, and by moderation team, I mean um, a space like this will usually have you know, some advisors, some coaches, some people from the staff who are kind of watching over it to, to keep an eye on it, make sure that everything's going well. And occasionally they'll post opportunities for, um, you know, announcements or opportunities or things that are relevant and important to get out to the learners. If you also have some content like short videos, maybe student success videos or alumni stories or websites and assets that you think students would find valuable, you can put them into the community. The nice thing here is unlike a website where, you know, number one, it can be really hard to find like stuff on a school website. I know it's really hard to update that information because not everybody has control over the content on the website. Um, and the website is a one dimensional, like one directional tool. You're, you're pushing out information and that's where that conversation ends. When you put content in your community, it's easily discoverable. It's all in one place. If the student searches, it will come back in the search process and the students can actually have a two-way conversation with you. So if you posted something and they have a question about it, they can ask that question here. So you open up a dialogue about the amazing resources that you're providing to add extra levels of clarity or feedback or, or find places where maybe a little bit more information would be valuable. And then the last feature um, I'll touch on is what's called our live events feature. This is really cool for online students. So we know online learners, super busy, a million things going on. We definitely started Inscribe as an asynchronous platform specifically with that in mind. We wanted to create the highest level of flexibility and adaptability for those learners. Now, at the same time, there are really cool synchronous events that you're probably putting on for these learners. Um, or events that they might want to put on together. For example, here's an example, a strong start workshop that's live right now. Maybe you have a guest speaker coming in. Maybe you're going to do a career workshop. We don't want the students to miss out on those opportunities. So you can post them as a live session in your community, give it a date and time, let the students know what it's about, use whatever synchronous tool you're already using, Zoom or Teams or whatever that is, and then post it. And so the students will get a notification. They can add the event to their calendar. About 15 minutes before the event starts, they'll get another alert saying, hey, this is getting ready to go live and they can click right through it to join your event. And I will tell you, schools have seen, you know, 500% increase in the number and the levels of participation in live events by promoting it through the Inscribe platform. Now, it doesn't mean all your students are going to be able to attend, but you can then take the recording of that event and bring it back into your community. So now if I missed out on the session live, I can still watch it. I can still participate. I can ask follow up questions, you know, really extending the life of that activity and welcoming again a broader set of students to participate. Um, okay. We won't have time to go through everything. I just really wanted to touch on those three primary aspects of the platform. And then just to touch briefly on the analytics. So you have in each community, um, your community administration area where you could see all the members of the community, what they've been up to. If we click into an individual, we can see specifically what they've been doing. And you can also see here the reputation system that's built into the platform. So we're giving students credit for their activity in the space, for being engaged, Keep in mind that being an engaged community member does not necessarily mean that you're posting all the time. Yes, if you're starting conversations, if you're contributing to other people's conversations, that's awesome. Um, but your, your student community will mirror to a large extent the models of any online community that you participate in, meaning you'll have about 20 or 25 percent of the participants who are really actively generating content but the vast majority of your participants are gonna fall into that viewer category. And do not, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Don't think that that 
type of interaction is not positive and beneficial. If I'm somebody who's coming in and I never post anything, but I see all these great, all these people who are maybe asking questions that I had, but I was too nervous to ask or professing some concerns and worries that I had, but I thought I was the only one dealing with that. Just seeing that and consuming that content is incredibly beneficial for learners and sort of silently in the background, they are building confidence and connection and belonging, even though their voice is not the one that's out there shouting. Um, and so that's what this good listener badge is all about. Are you in there? Are you consuming the content? Are you participating in that way? Um, we also have, uh, you can look at data on how your community is behaving over time. You know, who's in there? What are they doing? Uh, are you seeing spikes in activity at certain points in time? All of this can be exported so you can map, mash it up with data from other systems. And if you really want to get detailed, we have learning event level data that we store in the background that we can provide to you through export or API. And that will tell you every single action of every user in your community. And you can do some really cool work around that with things like um, figuring out who the leaders are in your community, how that might tie to your retention data, how that might tie to your um, other uh, course success data and so forth. So we're big believers in analytics. We don't wanna hold any of your data hostage. The more that we can give to you and help you understand how the activity in your community is benefiting you and your learners, you know, the better off for everybody. Okay. There is Any a question in the chat yeah. regarding, I guess, executive leadership buy-in. Do you have any recommendations? They're asking for a broil, boilerplate language. However, do you maybe have any recommendations on getting the executive leadership team um, on board and helping them understand the benefits of Inscribe? Yes, and then I'm going to welcome Aaron to also jump in <laughs> this question because um, you're probably, first of all, you're probably sick of hearing my voice. Um, we can definitely send you some stuff if you provide, like reach out to us. Um, I think the main thing is really understanding what are the goals uh, of your executive team? Is, is there an initiative around better retention or better persistence? Is there an initiative around higher levels of alumni engagement? um decreasing melt you know what are the quantitative goals that the executive team has set out and then we can absolutely help you craft the narrative around how a product like inscribe directly ties back to those quantitative outcomes Aaron, what would you add yeah no i i would add the same thing interestingly enough jonathan i know dr inch uh from a uh, a past life so um, for your president. So uh, perhaps we could uh, chat one-on-one, -on -one. but uh, to Katie's point, uh, we have some really good data around impacts on retention, which we know online learners uh, don't always persist at the same rate as on-campus learners. Uh, so great data around impact. If we talk about connecting prospective online learners uh, to current online learners to help drive enrollment, uh, to Katie's point, help drive alumni engagement. There are lots of things that we can provide, but uh, it, it all comes down to what problems are you trying to solve? So, uh, and I'll send an email directly and we can chat a little bit more about uh, that. But uh, I think for everybody in attendance, we'd certainly be happy to put something together. Yeah, 100%. Anything else in the chat moment? That's it for now. Okay, terrific. All right, so once again, I did want to give a little overview. I think it's nice to see the platform. We talk a lot about the use cases with our customers, but it's hard to you know visualize unless you really get in and see it and see how it works. And now you can start to probably draw the connections between, oh, I can see how this would save me time. I can see how this would help me scale. I can see how this helps students build relationships. Um, Nothing like a deeper dive, though. So if this is an initiative that you're really thinking about, I encourage you to reach out. Let us tailor a conversation really specifically to your institution, um, to Jonathan's point. Like, what are your goals that you're trying to achieve? What are the priorities for your institution? And, you know, do we do we feel like this is a, is a technology that can help you get there? And if so, how? Um, in the meantime... 
I would love to stay. I think we have a poll that we're going to put up. So if this is of interest to you, if you would like to learn a little bit more, just drop your name and email in that poll. Some one of our team members will reach out. We're very passionate about this space. Um, even if you decide Inscribe is not the tool for you, we'd still love to talk to you and learn a little bit about how you're thinking about it, uh, what other things you have tried that maybe worked or didn't work. We're really big into building community. So the more people that we can meet and bring together, the better for us. And I would love to stay connected as well. So quite easiest thing to reach me. You see my email address there. You're welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. So um, find me on LinkedIn, connect with me. And hopefully we can find ways to support you in this journey. You know, we're all in this together. It takes a village, we always say. So whatever we can do to support you, you know, we're happy to be there and to, to play that role as a partner.